That's a melody that takes me back. All the way back to the early 2000s as a matter of fact for my 6th birthday when I received this. Mega Man X5 for PC CD-ROM. And sure, I discovered the Mega Man series by accident when looking to try to find Mario ROMs on an NES emulator and accidentally booted up Mega Man 4 instead, but this... This was something else. This was... mine. This was for me to own, not borrowed, not emulated on a sibling's computer. This was my adventure, and I honestly owe everything I am today to this game. Yeah, I know this is a bit heavier hearted than you were expecting for a video like this. This is one of the reasons that this video took so long to get to. This game gets a terrible reputation online, and yet I still love this game. This game is arguably one of the most important games of my life. The reason it took so long for me to get to this video was because I didn't know how to do this game justice. Everyone on the internet seems to really, really dislike this game. But I want to give this game the proper look that I feel like it deserves that no one else seems to give it and tell you why this game, this game, is just so damn important to me. Yeah, going into this game, this was meant to be the X-Series swan song, the grand finale of the Maverick Hunter saga that would later lead to its sequel series, Mega Man Zero, though we all know how that turned out, there wouldn't be a second Legacy Collection if that were the case. And yeah, despite the fact that I have the PC version of this game, I'm gonna be using the Legacy Collection for a majority of this video. Wanna know what's different in the PC version? You get some ugly text that looks like it was wrote over in Microsoft Paint, and you get the original boss names. Yeah, let's just get that out of the way real quick. You guys have probably heard the story a million times, the head of localizing the game wanted to appeal to her husband, and named all of the bosses after Guns N' Roses members. Not the first Guns N' Roses reference in the Mega Man X series, that's a complete coincidence and she had no idea about this. Though most of the upgraded, or downgraded names I suppose, are better than the ones we got in the original release like Spiral Pegasus, Dark Necrobat, and Burned Dino Rex. I mean, what the hell is Matrex? That's just one hard syllable away from being a mattress. But a few of these, I mean, Crescent Grizzly, Tidal Whale? I'll take Grizzly Slash any day and farewell Duff McWhalen, you will be missed. Since the last time we looked at the Mega Man X series all the way back in July of 2018, Jesus, has it really been that long? We've been blessed with the Mega Man X Legacy Collections, and you already know that because I brought it up earlier. But one of the amazing features that this collection grants us is the ability to play with the original Japanese release of the game, and if you're playing X8, just... <laughs> Wow. But before jumping into X5, I wanted to do a quick playthrough of X4 just to get myself in the mood again, but this time in the Japanese version, and <laughs> wow, this was incredible. X and Zero both have their X5 grunt noises, the intro has this dope pui 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 moment with X cutting out the triangle of the X4 logo, the enemies have different sound effects, bosses have extra dialogue before fights, and oh my god, this is the best thing ever. So long. Hello. This was an amazing experience. This almost felt like I was playing a remastered version of X4 that I can't understand. Even the logo looks so much nicer with the blending between the three primary colors also associated with X and Zero, though this could be a coincidence because around this time primary colors were universally the colors of the heroes while the secondary colors were the villains. That's why some antagonists in old cartoons and stuff had green, purple, and orange color schemes. Though, with some exceptions, obviously. And if you look at the X5 logo, wow, look at that! Green, orange, and purple! I can assure you that is not a coincidence. Well, at least for the American version. The Japanese cover looks fucking incredible! You get this amazing, like, duality sort of sense with X and Zero, linked together by their... ear? <laughs> I guess. The logo itself doesn't have a lot of secondary colors in it, except for the green 5. It's more teal or cyan, I guess. Though there is a lot of purple around it, but I think that's more showing the Earth from events that's later going to be happening in the game. Not really symbolic of anything. I mean, what the heck even is the American title screen for this game? Is that Mega Man's ear? I guess that's one thing that the Japanese and American versions have in common. Though the Japanese versions included in the Legacy Collection does remove the Japanese ending theme for X4, One More Chance, 
This theme is incredible, I used it as my outro for my X4 video. But at least they're consistent. The Japanese intro theme for X5 is not present in this version, and honestly I think that's for the best because, uh, this just doesn't work for me, I'm sorry. The theme that we ended up getting outside of Japan is just so amazing, and it gives me goosebumps every time I listen to it. With a nice throwback to Zero's theme from Mega Man X1 and Mega Man 3's Weapon Get theme, it's the perfect way to start an intended finale like this. Just thinking about it is giving me goosebumps, holy fuck. I also got the Mega Man X Complete Works that I got as a Christmas present from my sister. In terms of X5, there's not a lot of new information here aside from some trivia about how some of the Rock Masters were designed, but I will say that it feels like they've learned a lot from designing the Mavericks from the past four games, but they also have this new, sleek, and fresh design to them, and on top of that, it's really nice to be able to see this artwork that's flashed during the intro cutscenes and seeing it uncompressed. You can also see this in the gallery of the X Collection, but still, this is really fucking cool. But now with that said, I think that it's finally time that I stop putting this dang thing off, and I can't get the disc out, and actually look at the game itself. But before we get started with the actual game... <coughs> <laughs> oh, come on! No, I actually want to show you the case real quick. Explosive catastrophe imminent. Oh, come on, guys. This is a near extinction level event. Show some respect. Cyber radicals have hacked into Eurasia's artificial gravity device, and now this gravitation. gravitation deprived space colony is spinning out of control. Dot, dot, dot. On a collision course with Earth! Collect all the parts of the beam cannon codenamed Enigma and deploy it within the next 24 hours. Actually, it's 16 hours, so we're off to a great start here. Join Mega Man X and his comrade Zero as they race against time. And they just downplayed Zero's role here. He's arguably more important than X's in this series. Oh sweet, this comes with a Windows 95 and 98 desktop theme. I might be a... Might be a little late for that offer. Oh man, does this take me back. Did you guys ever used to take game manuals with you to school or on the bus ride to school? This is one that I would take with me on a frequent basis when I was little if it wasn't already obvious from the wearing and tearing. We've got a nice introduction to our new cast, Alia, Douglas, Lifesaver, Dynamo, and Cygnus, who as a kid I swore was Sigma because I was a stupid kid and I didn't know how to read. Some absolutely appalling default controls. Game events and endings vary depending on how fast you complete a stage. Well, that's just flat out lying. Buy a Mega Man Legends 2! Actually, I already did. I picked it up last time I was in Philadelphia. Maybe I'll give this a look someday, but before that I gotta give a look to Mega Man Legends. But now let's pop this sucker in and... Oh, I never thought I'd see that again. Um, okay. <laughs> okay, God, what are you doing? Oh God, please, I'm not even sure if I have 4 megabytes of VRAM! <laughs> okay, the audio's a little bit broken, I'm not getting any music. I call it Tranquil X5. <laughs> okay, I can't stand this. I'm using my pinky to dash. This should be considered a war crime. Holy fuck. Though if you're not a fan of the controls, you could always take it up with the game's training mode. This is a first for the X series, and I think as a franchise altogether. This mode doesn't really serve much more of a purpose other than showing you that there's a few new gameplay mechanics introduced in X5, including crouching and... What would I call this? Line riding? Grapple? Grapple? Yeah. Jet hand. It's just a trick used to make platforming a bit more special than it really is. It's not bad, it doesn't hinder the experience at all, but it doesn't really add much either, it's just, it's just there. This training stage also gives us something that we're gonna be seeing a lot throughout the rest of the adventure, though on a scale much worse than the actual game itself. <sighs> Dialogue boxes. Interrupting dialogue boxes. This is something everyone seems to have beef with when it comes to X5, but for me, being one of the first video games I ever played and never owned, I didn't really see much problem with it, honestly. If anything, it made me really good at putting my thumb in the center of the face buttons and just mashing like my life depended on it. As an added bonus for putting up with all of those dialogue interruptions, you get a simulated rematch with Magma Dragoon from X4, something that I used to think was a pretty nice callback, and I suppose it still is, but now I realize it's just reusing him since X5 was built off X4's code. And there's nothing wrong with that, it's nice to see him again, though much, much weaker than before. We don't really get anything for beating him, so I guess it's just there. Alright, let's get this going. I've been putting this off way longer than I've been meaning to.
All right, starting off strong, Mega Man X Episode 5. That's how you know we're about to get into some real shit. Our story begins with an already resurrected Sigma having a back and forth with this unknown Reploid, sending him up to the Eurasia Space Colony, the last colony queued for repairs following the Repliforce Civil War from X4, with Sigma ordering this new Reploid to fill it to the brim with the Sigma virus, with Sigma himself infiltrating some construction zone and turning every bot in his presence maverick with our heroes sent to investigate. Or, rather, one of them is. You're free to choose between X and Zero at this point. Though the case does say that you're free to choose between X and Zero before every mission, this is arguably the most important choice you'll make in the game, and a character you choose will receive a buff for the rest of the adventure, with the opposite character you pick being sent in to attack Sigma and getting their ass handed to them. If you choose Zero, X will lose his Force Armor from X4, and if you choose X, Zero will lose the ability to fire his z bus Choose. X. Having the full set of armor from the get-go is miles better than being forced to use this weak, slow, pointless projectile. But I think it's kinda cool. In an attempt to have a sense of continuity, X starts with his force armor, either being destroyed by Sigma or being fully playable. Though it is a bit nerfed, you don't have the Nova Strike or infinite ammo. The stage itself is a nice callback to X1, and a bit X2 I suppose. You start off on a destroyed highway with these crusher drones, and as well as some new enemies that try to force you to crouch to hit their weak point, something that's pretty cool even if you can cheese it. Really just the first half of the stage is just exercising your newfound abilities like being able to bend your fucking legs, and a few moments near the end you use the grappling hook, if you want. But after X1 through 4, man this intro stage despite having a hell of a nostalgic impact on me is easily one of the most underwhelming intro stages in the series so far. It's not bad, it's not a bad stage by any means, but it's just there. Sigma rears his ugly head early this time, reshaping the head of the statue in his image and becoming a new vessel for his body. Well, I guess just his head. Challenging X and Zero to a pathetically easy showdown, but that was exactly what Sigma wanted, using his death as a way to spread the Sigma virus all across the globe once he was defeated. But that wasn't the only side effect of Sigma's intentional defeat, now the Eurasia Space Colony is on a collision with Earth, and it'll take approximately 16 hours to make it here. As a backup plan, the Maverick Hunters build the Enigma Cannon in hope of destroying the Eurasia Space Colony, and our Hunters are sent to... <laughs> I guess persuade fellow Reploids for parts necessary for the completion of the Enigma, giving us a story reason for why we're going after these eight Reploids. I use Persuade lightly, cause though most of the bosses we fight are indeed Maverick, there's a couple of exceptions, some of them fighting us because they think that we're in the wrong here. And who can really blame them? Tidal Whale for example doesn't even go full Maverick, he just calls us out on our bullshit for wanting to use the ocean for nuclear fusion, and just defends what he thinks is right. I'm the maniac! <laughs> And all of this is exemplified through the new Maverick Hunter team. Alia, our operator and computer expert, Cygnus, the new leader of the Maverick Hunters, Lifesaver, a Reploid whose entire purpose is to go, yo, I think there's something wrong with Zero, and Douglas, or Douglas, the only Reploid with an actual human name is our mechanical engineer. Say Douglas! Yeah. These guys really just exist for world building and plot progression, with X and Zero taking more of a backseat to the new guys who relay data through them. They'll tell you about the level and, I guess, plot exposition? Sometimes? They don't really take away from the gameplay at all, unless you're not a fan of interrupting dialogue boxes. This can really get a bit grating. The game gives us the boss order right off the bat, so I hope you're not a fan of experimenting with what bosses to take down next. The levels themselves are fairly diverse. You've got a level where you hop back and forth between exploding cars and auto scroller with a giant mini boss that's fun at first but really overstays its welcome. Arguably the most traditional level is Izzy Glow's stage with a really unique mini boss that takes advantage of those grappling lines and a not half bad boss fight to boot. And I just realized I said Izzy Glow, I meant Shining Firefly because it's like throwing away my childhood. It's Shining Firefly. Fuck! After defeating our second boss, not really a maverick, the Reploid that Sigma hired reveals himself to be Dynamo, showing up and giving us a whooping like he promised. I guess. Admitting that he's not really here to kill us, just slow us down, likely just to make the clock tick down. And lastly, out of our four starting stages, we've got the one that... <laughs> uh, okay. Welcome to Squid Adler's stage. The fucking ready prompt hasn't even gone away yet, and I've already died. Did I say Squid Adler? God damn it. This is one stage that you are always going to hear about when people talk about their problems with X5, and the part that they complain about is barely a fifth of the level. If you ever need a good example of how first impressions can affect gameplay, this is a prime example right here. And I never thought I'd say this, but good thing game overs are totally meaningless. Just start off right where you left off with little to no consequence. If anything, running out of 
lives is basically the game going, Hey, you really suck at this. Do you want us to try another stage? No? Oh, okay, well, I'll be here when you change your mind. It's so bad to the point where it feels like gaining extra lives is more of a nuisance than losing them. And I really hope you're not going for 100% completion because on top of the ride chaser sequence at the beginning that really puts your reaction time to the test, if you really want this stage's armor piece, you're going to have to put in some real effort to collect these little energy pellets at the end and unload them into this unsuspecting wall. Unsuspecting wall. That sounds like a great band name. And if you don't collect enough of them, the game makes you sit there and watch as X and Zero unloads every single last one of them into the wall just for them to go, wah, wah, you fucking loser. Now do it again! But then you need to come back later anyway if you want this level's heart piece, one that you can't get. Good. You need the Gaia armor to get the heart piece in this stage. But you can't get the Gaia armor unless you get this armor, so I hope you like backtracking. But you can't even use the part of the armor that would let you walk on it because whenever you get a new armor piece from Dr. Light, he's like, Hey X, I'm locking these four armor pieces behind a security thing so you can't use the new armor unless you get all four pieces. I am getting lightheaded. And the funny thing is that the rest of the stage actually isn't half bad. You've got some fun, unique timing, keys, and lock sort of puzzles, and the boss himself on top of also being pretty fun. Also was friends with Launch Octopus from X1 and then goes Maverick right in front of you. What the hell is going on with this game? It felt a bit ham-fisted, sure, but it, it, it's, it's cool, it's, okay? It's just cool. With the Enigma Cannon built from the parts of our fallen Reploid comrades, Doglass fires the Enigma Cannon only for it to just nudge it back just a little bit and delay the inevitable, making the death of Duff McWhalen a total lost cause. Tidal Whale. God, fuck. But the Maverick Hunters do have a backup plan. An old space shuttle with a broken autopilot courtesy of the Sigma virus making it nearly a one-way trip for anyone who volunteers. And now we've got the final four Mavericks to deal with, and this time they're shown to us in reverse boss order. Wow, you're really shaking things up, Capcom. And from here on, it's your normal Mega Man formula, but by this time you probably have the Falcon armor. An armor that just utterly destroys any possible challenge this game could have had. You could just fly! over literally everything. Like you could still die from spikes and getting crushed, but <laughs> there's, there's no challenge here. It feels like the game doesn't know it at times, but at the same time they hid two Gaia armor pieces somewhere where you'd need this flying ability to reach it. So they, they clearly knew how much of the level design this is breaking. The levels themselves though, they're they're fun. You've got your slow motion, not water level with a gravity swapping gimmick similar to Mega Man 5's Gravity Man stage, but it's more of as if the level flips rather than Mega Man flipping. And you've got an interesting puzzle to get the armor capsule. Dino Rex's stage is just an over glorified game of red light, green light. And aside from the dragon boss callback from Mega Man 2, there's really nothing noteworthy at this stage. Spiral Pegasus's stage is pretty dope for the music alone, but the stage has a gimmick where as soon as one of these time bombs is present on screen, they'll start counting down and if you don't deal with it in time, you'll suffer a massive chunk of damage. Something that I feel is better for Zero's Swiss Army Knife style of gameplay, assuming that you've beaten the bosses in the order that the game wants you to. I really envy any player that can do this without special moves. Spiral Pegasus himself, interestingly enough, will reference Colonel and implying that he's formerly Repliforce. He does say that he's going Maverick, but he fights you not because of that, but because it's what the Colonel would have wanted. And that's the kind of stuff that I really look for in a sequel like this, especially after an event so significant like the Repliforce Civil War, I'm surprised that this is one of the handful of callbacks to that we get. It's like the last game didn't matter. What the fuck am I saying? It's a Mega Man X game. They never really cared about chronology like this until now, and it feels like they, just, they don't know how to do it. <laughs> I can't even sip coffee right? With the space shuttle nearly set to go, our friend Dynamo pays us one last visit in hope to slow us down. And unfortunately, they were way too lazy to make some new artwork for the background, so they just reused some artwork that's used in a later cutscene, completely ignorant to the fact that we are now seemingly fighting while standing at a 45 degree angle. Dynamo does tell us that we're a bit more powerful than he initially anticipated before retreating, but that just raises some questions. Is the reason Sigma didn't make Dynamo go Maverick was so that that he could retreat because he knew that if he was Maverick he'd probably get himself killed? We're never told this. In fact, there's a lot of things that feel more implied 
but never explicitly told, but not in that fun sort of like, ooh, it's a mystery. If the reason for the non-Maverick bosses being mad at us was because of the Maverick Hunter's name being tarnished after the Repliforce Civil War, that would make a lot of sense. Forcing X and Zero to face the repercussions of Sigma's masterminding and puppeteering to paint this negative light over the Repliforce and Maverick Hunters. That feels like what they were going for with Cygnus even taking over as the Maverick Hunter leader after the previous leader stepped down from embarrassment over the whole thing, but they never go there! The whole thing was just one big missed opportunity with a bunch of heavy implications that sort of give him a sense that they don't know what the hell they're doing! Feels like I'm talking about Batman v Superman, fuck. I understand. <laughs> Now at this point in the game you probably have both armor sets after backtracking your way to hell and back just to get these things. I hope you like the look of the guy armor cause we're barely gonna be using this thing. It's the definition of situational, really only being used to collect some items that are over some spikes because this thing is impervious to spikes. But it can't use any special weapons and its mobility is cranked down to absolute shit. But if you can power through its limited mobility this thing just shreds through bosses and honestly that's a lot of fun with it. It's just the journey of making it to the boss with the armor. That's just dreadful. This also brings X armor count in the game up to three so far, each situational in their own right, making the option of switching to zero feel almost completely pointless unless you just want to play as zero for the sake of playing as zero. If you're trying to pick a character who's best for the current level you're about to proceed into, chances are that character is X with the correct armor set and is very rarely zero. I mean, why would I bring zero into Axel Rose Red stage when I could just fly over all the obstacles with the Falcon armor? Seriously, this thing is fucking disgusting. Uh, never mind. Man, Axel Rose Red. I always loved this dude's design. And the only level whose stage is literal Guns and Roses. I always thought this dude was special. Maybe it's because he had the same sort of humanoid proportions as X and Zero. It's just one of those characters that I loved as a kid for no reason other than he just piqued my interest, and that's what this video is about after all. With the last of the bosses defeated, the Maverick Hunters begin their last ditch effort to save the Earth from annihilation, with Zero volunteering to man the helm of the aptly named Space Shuttle, the Space Shuttle, and fly it straight into the core of the space colony. Um, <laughs> uh, wait a second, that's not right, hold on. There we go. That's what I wanted to see. The game goes silent, the hunter shuttle barely finishing the job, destroying just over half the station, leaving the Eurasia space colony a barrage of space debris, just waiting to cause some trouble. And without hearing any word from Zero, the hunters begin to panic. X and the gang are forced to evacuate as the debris from the space colony crash into the Earth, with humans and reploids alike facing near extinction. Though all of our Maverick hunters end up a-okay. Why? Well, convenience, of course. With the hunter team starting to regroup after the crash, Alia picks up an energy signature which which is presumably Zero's, but with Zero being exposed to such a concentrated amount of the Maverick virus, it just clicks in him like a switch. The Maverick virus that was taken from Zero and transplanted over to Sigma has found its way back to its original owner, the virus awakening Zero to what he was originally intended to be, a killing machine meant to destroy all in his path, including the creations of light. And X, hesitant as anyone would be when they find out that their friend is a murder machine, has to put a stop to him. Notice how I haven't really talked about X at all. This story has really barely anything to do with the guy despite the level design being seemingly more built for X than Zero. X takes much more of a backseat to the story and I think that's on purpose as Kenji and Afune really wanted to make this story a conclusion that could lead into the Mega Man Zero series, which I already talked about earlier. But back to Zero himself, this was apparently Sigma's plan all along, cause you see, Sigma somehow got in contact with Dr. Wily. Well, we're never really told how he's been communicating with Sigma, but since the Dr. Light Hologram knows who Zero and Alia are, implying that this is in fact not a pre-recorded message and the AI just keeps up with recent events, I think it's pretty safe to assume that Wily's done the same. I mean, he put his brain in a robot in X2, and I think it's incredibly likely that a backup of Wily's consciousness is floating around out there somewhere. But with Zero truly awakened to his original purpose, the concentration of the Sigma virus, now known as the Zero virus, causes part of cyberspace itself to rip into the real world, which is really just the story's explanation for like, hey, look at all this cool shit! You remember this from the classic games? Isn't this awesome? And <laughs> yes, it is. I'm sorry. I, I love it. Though I think that the stages are in the wrong order. I mean, we start with a quick man throwback with those instant kill lasers, and at the end, we fight a goddamn devil monster!
since no classic Mega Man throwback is complete without some sort of devil boss, and since this is the original ending of the X series, sure, let's just make it the hardest one out there! Random patterns? Sure! Random weak point placements? Oh, fuck yeah! A secondary hitbox that lingers, leaving you with barely any wiggle room, and randomly deciding to start going back and forth? Yeah, just- Oh, yeah, let's go! <laughs> <laughs> At least you could cheese this boss, whether it's with a falcon armor or just ducking and only jumping when you have to. But damn, this boss is so freaking tedious. Even with its weakness, this thing takes so goddamn long to put down. And though it does get a little bit ear grating, I gotta say that the remix of the Mega Man 1 Fortress boss music is a nice callback, but it really is ear grating after a while. The ironic thing? is that this might be the hardest boss in the whole fortress, which, if that's an intentional callback to Mega Man 1 where the devil is arguably the most hardest boss in the fortress despite being your first boss encounter, well, man, I don't know how I feel about that. It feels like you're just kind of throwing us into the nostalgia dungeon and expecting us to accept it without really tweaking it and realizing that, hey, maybe the original method wasn't quite the best way of handling it. But I still accept it. If it were up to me, I would have had it start off with a second Zero stage, which starts off directly referencing the first Fortress stage from X1. And though it does deviate a bit later on, which I assume is an original layout, not really a reference to much, I think that starting off with the Zero Fortress with the X1 layout would have made the most sense if they're going for an all-out throwback, especially with the boss of the stage being a rematch with an upgraded Rangada Bangada. Rangada Bangada. Rangada Bangada. <laughs> I, I like a Rangada Bangada. Who the fuck came up with that name? This boss is way easier than the Shadow Devil before it, especially if you bring the Gaia armor, which negates spikes, because yeah, sometimes the spikes come out of the walls now, probably the only bullshit death in this stage, but it sure beats the hell out of the entirety of the insta-kill traps in the last level. To my knowledge, the third stage doesn't really have any throwbacks to it, but it does have one secret that requires you to go in as unarmored X for most of the stage. If you're able to make it most of the way through the stage, drop down this pit and hold right, you can get the returning ultimate armor from X4, complete with the infinite Nova Strike and everything. And marking the first and only time that you can get the ultimate armor from a capsule midway through your adventure without using cheat codes or New Game Plus. However, if you want to use it on the upcoming bus, which is a doozy, you're gonna have to give yourself a game over and return to HQ just to equip it. It's not applied automatically, so I really hope you weren't stockpiling lives, because like I said earlier, lives tend to be more of a nuisance than anything in this game. At the end of the stage, Zero finally shows himself, the materialized fortress showing that oh-so-familiar Wily insignia as our old friend descends down into the battlefield, fully immersed into his awakened self. The legacy of the Mad Doctor from over a hundred years ago, two creations of Wily and Light duking it out one final time, and a pretty tough boss fight assuming you don't use his weakness, and man, one of the greatest music tracks to ever grace this franchise for such a climactic ending. And I don't think I'm alone in that mindset, given that this is the only non-remixed track from the X series to make it into Smash Ultimate, and just, oh man, listen to this. God damn masterpiece, that's what that is. Laying the finishing blow on Zero, our blue bomber passes out from exhaustion. I mean, he's clearly delirious thinking that Zero could use the soul body from X4, X's weapon from X4. With Zero defeated and X unconscious, Sigma appears in an attempt to finish off the unconscious X, but Zero in the nick of time snaps back into his non-maverick self and takes the blast. With Sigma going, oh shit, that was pretty cool, and fucking off, completely failing to capitalize on the moment to kill both of our heroes. Okay, so I should bring up that the route for Zero going Maverick is technically the bad ending, but it's really unclear which is the canon ending, with the rest of the game post-defeated Zero making barely any sense. It's as if the story was cut in half and given a half ass second and third act as a result, since everything that follows the defeat of Zero in the good ending route makes a lot of sense, but everything before it is just a clusterfuck. Combined with the RNG of the Enigma and the shuttle even working, and leaving the final act of the game up to chance? No, I don't like that. I think from a gameplay side, Zero going Maverick is my choice, and from a story perspective, offers much more payoff. Because if Zero doesn't go Maverick, then it just turns into another Mega Man X game where the infighting between our heroes just feels forced. Sigma's up to something bad, let's stop him, roll credits. But Zero going Maverick has been alluded to since X2, and I think that the name of the Final Fortress also parallels this, uh, with the first stage being Origin, then Grief, then Awakening, and then Birth, well at least according to the wiki. Birth being our final level, 
level and a huge tonal shift when you think about it. Zero is dead, the rest of the world is in shambles, and millions of humans and reploids alike are fucking dead. So how do we set the mood for this grand finale? FUCKING DISCO PARTY! Is it so much to ask for time to grieve? The music is pretty cool and the boss rush is... mixed, I guess. On one hand, I think that it's great that they mixed it up, giving the bosses much larger health bars so it's a lot more than just a cheap rematch with these guys. But at the same time, I feel like that's the whole point. The boss rushes were always so much fun because you feel how much stronger you've become both as a player and as Mega Man X or Zero. But with this prolonged health bar, it just feels like they're padding out the game more than anything, and with a level 96 health bar, I feel like some of those parts would probably come in handy right about now, which is one thing I forgot to touch on earlier, a new concept for the X series, the equipable parts that can change X and Zero's abilities just a little bit, like always firing a charge shot, faster charging, higher jumps, faster walking speed, and a stronger Z saber for Zero. But the thing is, you straight up can't get these items until the bosses reach a certain level, and the fastest way of getting that is getting 8 game overs in a row with returning to HQ each time, and as someone who doesn't really use these parts to begin with, I couldn't really be bothered for this. X5 is where I started to stop going for 100% completion in this series because it's just not fun. Maybe if I'm bored, but now that I'm a grown man who has other games to play besides X5, Millennium Digger, and Island Wars, I really don't have any drive to collect all of these things. And considering it requires you to prolong the game just a little bit, but even then you're only going to be getting half of them because you got to choose wisely for what build you want, but the game doesn't tell you which parts you get, so I really hope you have a guide ready. Man, do you remember Planet Mega Man? With all eight rematches over with, we've still got one more thing to do, and trust me, the callbacks are not over yet, because no Mega Man game is complete without these fucking things! Ah! Yeah, goddamn refill. Motherfucker, listen! Listen, you come to my home, you play Mega Man on my TV, <laughs> and now you want more coffee. Yeah. Sigma finally reveals himself, looking rather stylish with an X1 cloak callback, admitting that his whole goal here was to awaken Zero's true self before their bout we saw back in X4. When the virus released from the statue wasn't enough, he infected the Eurasia space colony with the help of Dynamo, turning it into a breeding ground for the virus in hopes that that would be enough to awaken him. I want to know what the heck is going on in the background here because with the Zero space being more of a construct of Zero's mind or the virus itself, what is the significance of this? Is it just to look cool, bringing the pods of X and Zero here together for symbolic purposes? <laughs> I have no fucking idea what it's supposed to symbolize, but I'd be lying if I said it didn't look cool. And that feeling is only amplified when we see Sigma's final form. Well, <clears throat> somewhat. I think that the final boss being a static pre-rendered image of Sigma with these floating hands kind of breaks the immersion a bit, the, the little that I had anyway. Only because this image quality of the hands matches up with, say, X here, but the Sigma in the background just looks like ass in comparison. It worked in X1 because the sprite work between Sigma's body and Sigma's hands were consistent, but this gives me crazy Uncanny Valley vibes here. But the eerie final boss music does restore that initial sense of finality. With Sigma defeated for the fifth time, he self-destructs, destroying the facility and leaving X a destroyed torso in the middle of nowhere before the hologram ghost of Dr. Light tells X to relax just for a little bit longer. A week later, X is back in action with his memory wiped clean of everything about his old red friend, with Maverick Hunter HQ looking over him concerned that he won't even accept any information regarding Zero, with X distracted on his own plans to build a new sanctuary called Elysium. The credits rolling by allowing us to reminisce with a very somber piano piece. Zero is gone, X can't remember his former mentor and combat buddy, and it's a rather sad note to end the X series on, regardless of the fact that there's three more games after this. Imagine if this was the end, Zero is gone, X's memory deleted, and Sigma presumably defeated for good. It's just a really bittersweet way to go. But that's not the only way it can go. Remember when we had to rewind earlier because Zero survived the space colony? Well, on top of being able to bring Zero into the third Zero space stage and being able to fight X himself, where he actually uses the soul body, Zero doesn't immediately bite the dust as soon as Sigma comes to finish X off, standing confidently enough to make Sigma go like fuck this and retreat back into his little disco fortress. And defeating Sigma with X while Zero is still alive, Sigma's self-destruction leaves Zero as a fucking torso, while X tries to help his poor friend hold on to reality long enough for Sigma to 
fucking skewer the guys with Zero in his dying moment giving the final blow to Sigma with a Z-Buster, which is super weak, so X probably could've just dinked that little bitch. X's body shows up outside of the collapsed fortress again, with the Force Ghost of Dr. Light restoring X's body, and this time three years pass, with X going back to Maverick busting with Maverick Hunter HQ, and X taking Zero's saber with him as a way to remember his fallen comrade and a bit of a happier ending, but if this was supposed to be the ending to the X series, I guess I would have been okay with it. I think that there were some good ideas pitched here, but in execution, I admit it feels a little bit rushed. I mean, barely of this story has anything to do with X, and it's also bizarre having your finale include all of these other side characters just to move on from it. In that sense, I'm glad that X 6 through 8 exists, because I really like these side characters. The only one I didn't really care for is Lifesaver, because he doesn't really do shit in this game. I think the best way I could describe X 5 is mixed. They introduce a lot of good and a lot of bad, with the game wanting to tell a cinematic story but also feeling like it doesn't have a sense of what the hell it's trying to do, and it feels like the canon ending was split across what's two completely different timelines. It's like there's some sort of disagreement on how they wanted the game to go, with the team never truly deciding on if they want to focus on story or the gameplay and they never really find that nice middle ground, with the closest to that being the virus counter at the bottom left of the screen. And if you collect too many of these angry Sigma floating heads, X will slowly start to die, but Zero will become completely invincible. You know, cause Zero virus, he's supposed to do- he- it's who he is! And yet, I still love this. I say critically, yeah, X5 is not so amazing, and though not stooping down to the levels of X7 or uh, X6, I can't help but love this game. The music just gives me chills and is just ingrained into my skull and gives me the biggest rush of nostalgia every time I put that shit on. Alias interruptions don't really bother me, though I'd be lying if I said that the text sound wasn't ear grating. The only stages that I don't look forward to on repeat playthroughs is the goddamn lava level and former Duff McWhalen because fuck that. The newcomers are great in making X and Zero feel like they're part of a hunting team, but I wish we could have seen some like humans or maybe something to flesh out the world other than the small little echo chamber of all of these reploids together. I want to see the rest of the world. World, you know? It feels like the game kind of starts from the halfway point if you think about it. Where'd Dynamo come from? I don't know. Where'd all these secondary characters come from? I don't know. How did Sigma return and how long has he been active for? I don't know. Well, I guess to be fair, X4 did the same thing, but at least it made him more active while also hiding in the shadows. And also, what's the deal with the Eurasia Space Colony? Part of me feels like they should have just gone with the destroyed remains of the final weapon from X4. I mean, we never really truly saw the thing explode. They could have easily reused that thing. But that momentous feeling of closure towards Zero's arc, a killing machine turned hero forced to be destroyed by his best friend once he's reawakened into that original state. And I find if you could just focus on that, that would be incredible because this game means everything to me. Being one of the handful of games that I owned at the time, aside from some freeware games on my computer, this really opened my eyes to a sense of storytelling that I never really experienced in a game prior to this. X5 was my gateway drug into gaming that I know today, and if it wasn't for this game, I wouldn't be the man you hear yelling through your speakers in this very moment. I know that this game gets a bad rep online, and actually sitting down and paying attention to the details that, that otherwise I never really would have noticed, aside from reading the wiki about the story, it does kind of fall apart with things that otherwise I never really would have noticed in the first place. It, it, it's kind of like when you stay in your hometown for a long time and you see all those signs for restaurants and stuff, that it never really clicks in your head that those are an actual place you can go. Like, you just kind of think that it's part of the environment around you. X5 was kind of like that, and once I started putting all these pieces together, it really sort of redefined my perspective of how I see this game. But X5 is going to continue to hold a very special place in my heart for being the first real video game I owned, and it really shaped my opinion on video games for decades to come. Maybe this game is the reason I'm able to get enjoyment out of games like Mighty No. 9, Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite, and hell, maybe the entirety of the Wii U. I guess maybe there's a silver lining to this thing after all. Thank you for making it to the end of this piece. I know this was a long one, and probably my most highly requested video, and I couldn't have done it without 
both you, the fans, and my Patreon supporters over on Patreon, of course. Especially my $10 supporters, uh, EMT Neutrino, Chef Kilo, Mark Travis, Slim Jim's Media Bin, Soap, and the Swide, Swide Quest Gamer. Side Quest Gamer. Thank you guys so much. This video came out as fast as it did because of you guys. And I know it feels like this video took forever to come out. Imagine how long it would have taken without their help. This was a really long and exhausting video, and I really hope you enjoyed it. Please consider supporting me. Please consider subscribing, uh, liking the video, commenting, all that. But now if it's okay with all of you, I'd like to rest now.